Hey guys, in this tutorial I'm gonna teach you all the things you need to know about object-oriented programming in Python. You don't need to have any other previous knowledge about classes and objects to follow me here. So we start at zero and then step by step improve our knowledge until we have covered all the important concepts. And here is the outline. So I divided this course into five sections. First, we start with a little motivation. So why do we need classes? And then I show you how we can create classes. Then we talk about the difference between classes and instances. Then I show you how we can use functions inside classes. Then we talk about inheritance. So how we create a base class and then a child class that derives from this base class. And this is probably the most complex topic, but also the most interesting one. Then we talk about encapsulation. So this is a fancy word that I'll explain later. And then I also show you how we use properties. So this goes hand in hand with the encapsulation principle and shows a Pythonic way how to use getters and setters. And during all those sections, we also talk about the four principles of object oriented programming. So this is a typical interview question for beginners and everyone should be able to explain them. So right now I only tell you those four principles. So we have inheritance, polymorphism, encapsulation and abstraction. But I will not tell you the definition right now. So instead we will learn about them while I'll explain the concepts in the code later. And then at the end, hopefully you have a good understanding of what all those principles mean. So I hope that you stay with me until the end. And now before we start, just a quick note. If you find this tutorial helpful, then please hit the like button and consider subscribing to the channel. I provide a lot of free tutorials here and this will help me to keep going. So let's jump to my editor and let's start with the motivation. So why do we need classes? So in Python we have primitive data structures like integers and strings or even lists, but they are designed to represent only simple pieces of information. So what happens if we have a more complex type that we want to represent? So in this example, let's use a software engineer object. So we want to represent a software engineer. So what we could do here is we could use a list. So let's create a software engineer one and then we use a list. So let's define what we want to have here. So we um, give him a position. So this is his title software engineer. Then he should have a name. He should have an age and then the level and the salary. So we could use a list here. So let's say the position is a software engineer. Then the name, let's say this is Max and then he is 20 and he is a junior um, developer and let's give him a salary of let's say 5000. So this is one way we can do this. So and now when we use multiple, then let's create a second one. So our software engineer two. And let's say this is Lisa, she is 25 and she is already a senior and her salary, let's say this is 7000. So you might already see that when we create more of those objects, then this can become cumbersome and also error prone. So for example, what will happen if, for example, in this list, the name is missing? Or what happens if this is not even a software engineer, but something else, for example, a designer. And then what also will happen when our software engineer should do things. So let's say later he should write some code. 
So then only our software engineer should do this and not um, if this is something else. So if this is a designer or something. So you might already see that a list is not uh, the perfect data structure to represent such a complex object. And this is the reason why we have classes. So classes are used for more complex data structures and they contain functions that then describe the behavior of our class. So a class is basically a blueprint how something should be defined. And the way we create a class in Python is with the keyword class. And then we give it a name and by convention we start here with a capital letter. So let's say this is a class called software engineer. And for now I only say pass. So we don't do anything here. And now this is already a valid class in Python. So let's say here this is a class. And then we can create an instance of this class. So here, when we create a instance, we say our software engineer one equals and then a the name of this class and then parentheses. So now we have an instance of this class. So now what is the difference again? So a class is only a blueprint of this data structure. So here we are going to describe um, how this data structure looks. So for example, it says it has a name and an age, but we don't put any concrete information in here. Only then later when we create our instance, then we say the name is Max or Lisa and he's 20 years old or 25. So this is the difference between instance and class. And now let's have a look at how we can implement our class. So right now it's not doing anything, but if I run the code, then um, this works so it won't crash. So now let's um, say our class should have all those attributes that I listed here. And we will do this with the init function. So we define it with our with our function keyword def and then double underscores and then init and then again double underscores and then as a first argument it always gets self. So this is just something that we need to know and I will talk about this in a few moments. So this is a special method that we can use to initialize our object. And here we can put in any parameters that we want. So let's say here we want to have the name, the age, the level and the salary. And in here, the only thing we do for now is um, we want to store them inside this um, class. So what we do is we say self dot name equals name. And then we do this for all those parameters. So self dot age equals age self dot level equals level and self dot salary equals salary. Now this might look like it's redundant, but this is actually important. So there is a difference. So all of those um, parameters are the parameters that we pass in from the outside. And all those parameters that are that have self here that can be used inside this class. And these have a special name. So they are called instance attributes. And now if we run this code, then this will actually crash. So we see we get a type error, missing four required positional arguments. So now since we created this init function, 
when we then create a instance, then we also have to use those parameters. So let's use the same four parameters that we have here in this same order. We have the name, the age, the level and the salary. And now if we run this, then this works. And now we can access those instance attributes. So now, for example, I can print and then se1, software engineer1, dot name. And let's also print dot age. And then we see that this is working. So we pass in max and 20 and also those parameters. And then inside here, they are stored. And then we can access them like so. And then when we do this, um, it is referring to those instance attributes self.name and self.age. So again, not to these ones, these are only the parameters that we pass in from the outside here. All right, so by now we already know how we can have a class and a instance and then instance attributes. So what happens if we um, don't write a attribute in here, but instead we say it um, here. So let's say our software engineer has an alias and here let's say his alias is he is a keyboard magician. And now this is called a class attribute. So here inside our init function, we have the instance attributes. And then here we have a class attribute. And now the difference is that a instance attribute only belongs to one object that we created here, and not to the whole class. For example, we cannot say software engineer dot name. So if we do this, then this crashes because the name is only tied to a specific instance. But on the other hand, a class attribute um, is um, the same for every instance. So it can also be used on the class itself. So we could say um, print se1.alias, so this works, but we can also say um, print and then software engineer.alias. This also works. So again, the instance attributes are only tied to one instance and we cannot use it on the whole class. But on the other hand, a class attribute that is defined here can be used on the class itself because it's the same attribute for each um, instance. So let's say we create another instance of the software engineer. So this time we take these parameters. So we have Lisa and 25 a senior and her salary and this is our software engineer 2 and so here again if we print se2.alias then this is also a keyboard magician so we can simply say and uh, we can call this on the class software engineer.alias all right, so this is all for section one. So let's do a quick recap what we learned here. So we learned how we can create a class and we should know that a class is used as a blueprint. So here we only describe what we want to have in our class. So the name, the age and the level but we don't store um, complex or the actual attributes, the actual name and the age. So the class is only the 
blueprints and then we know how we create a instance where we have the concrete um, the concrete parameters and an instance sometimes it's also called just an object so here we have an instance and here we have another instance so now you should know the difference between a class versus an instance we also know that we can define instance attributes and they are defined in the double underscore init function and here we need self and then we also see how we can use a class attributes and what's the difference between a class attribute and an instance attribute. All right, so let's have a look at how we use functions in our classes and this should also further clarify why a class is a better structure than a list like here to represent a software engineer. So let's start with a little motivation why we should use functions in classes. So we could of course just define a global function here and pass in a software engineer. So let's say our software engineer should do something. So in this example, he should write some code. So we define a function code and then here we simply print and let's then say we pass in this list. So we want to print the name. So if we want to access the name from this list, then we get it with the index um, one. This is the name. So let's simply print this um, name is writing code dot dot dot. And now we can call this function. So we can say code and then software engineer one. Then this is working. So it tells us Max is writing code. If I pass in number uh, software engineer two, then it says Lisa is writing code. So this works. But now let's say we have a third object and this is a designer. So here we use a list and the position is a designer and then the name is a, let's say this is Philip. And then we could also pass this designer to the code function. So if we say D1, then this is also telling us that Philip is writing code, but actually this shouldn't be possible because yeah, I know Maybe some designers also know how to code, but let's say in our example, our designer shouldn't be able to code, then this shouldn't be uh, possible. But if we write it like this, then we can pass anything into this function and for anything we can try to write some code. So wouldn't it be better if we tie this function to our class software engineer? And this is exactly what we're going to do. So let's delete this and then let's grab this function. And then here inside of our class, we define this function. And now what we do don't need is we don't need this software engineer object but the same like here we need to have self so this is something that we just have to remember for every instance method and yeah by the way so this is called a instance method we have to write this self here and then we can access all of those instance attributes that we stored here. So here we can say we can access the name by saying self dot name is writing code. So this is how we um, define a instance method. And then when we have an instance here, then this instance can do uh, something so this can execute this function. So now we can call se1.code dot 
code and this is working. So now it says Max is writing code and we can also say se2.code and then we also get Lisa is writing code. So this is how we use an instance method and please also note that um, we have this one parameter self here but we don't pass this into this function when we execute it. So this is automatically included for us. So the same in the init function here, we have self um, as first parameter, but then when we create it, we start with the name. So remember that for each instance method, when we define the function, then we have to use self but later when we call the functions, we don't use the self anymore. So this self parameter refers to the instance um, itself. So to this op specific object, and then we can access all those object specific attributes, self.name, self.age, etc. So now we have our first instance method. So let's create another one. So let's say define another more specific code function. So let's call this code in language and then remember self as first parameter. And then let's say we also give it a parameter language. And then we say here um, self.print, self.name is writing code in. And then here let's use this language. So we see we can also use parameters for a instance method. So now we can say for example se1 and then code in language and let's say Python and now if we run this we see we get Max is writing code in Python and for example we can also say se2 code in language and let's say C++ then we see Lisa is writing code in C++ so we see we can use parameters and we can also return things from these functions. So let's create another function in formation with self. And here we want to create a variable information equals and let's use an F string. And then we say name equals and then we can access self dot name and let's also say h equals and then let's access again our self dot h and let's say we also want to print the level so level equals and then self dot level so this is the information and then we simply return the information here and then here we can print and then call se1.information as a function. So now if we run this, then we get the information here. Okay, so now we know how we create instance methods. And now let's talk about some special methods. And these are the double underscore or D under methods. So they start with a leading double underscore and a trailing double underscore. Like the init function, this is also a D under method. So these are special methods that are already provided um, for us in Python. So every object already has this. So if we don't um, declare them, then it still has some implementation of this, these functions. But then if we write our own function, then it's using uh, this function. So let me show you two more examples of the under methods. And one is called the string or str method and this also gets self of course and then um, this will be executed whenever our object is converted to a string so like here 
um, we can say we want to have this as a representation uh, for the string. So we want to print the information. So we create this information and here we also have to return this. So we do have to do this here inside this method. So now let's comment this out for now and let's print only our software engineer object and see what's happening. So then we see we get this, so we get our class name object at, and then this is a memory location. So this is working, it doesn't crash, so it prints some information and this might even be useful, but in our case it doesn't tell us a lot of things about our object. So let's say instead we want to have these information when we print our object. So then we can define this string method with uh, double leading and trailing underscores and we return them. And then we don't need this function anymore. So we can get rid of the information function. And now if we run this and print our object, then it's printing exactly this. So this is the string representation and that's why it's printing the name, the age and the level. So now if we print SE2, then it's printing name Lisa, age 25, level senior. So this is um, one special D under method. So let's write this here, D under method. And there are a bunch of more. And for this, I recommend to check out the official documentation. And right now I want to show you one more. And this is the equal function or equal method. And this gets self and it also gets another parameter which is called other. And here we compare two objects. So again, let's test this without um, writing this. So then, as I told you, this is already provided for us, but with the default implementation right now. And by default, it is comparing the memory address. So now let's say we have another software engineer with exactly the same um, parameters, so SE3. And now if we print, let's print SE2 equals equals SE3. Then if we run this, then we see this is false. Even though they look the same here, um, this is false because um, it's comparing the memory address and this is different. So now let's um, implement this define equal equal function. And now let's say our um, object is the same. Let's say in our case, it's the same if the name is the same and the age is the same. So we could of course also check those or other things, whatever we want. But in this example, let's say we want to return and then we say self dot name equals equals other dot name and self dot age equals equals other dot age. If both are the same, then this returns true and otherwise false. So now if we run this and print if this is the same, then we see we get true because the uh, name is the same and the age is the same. Now let's say this age is 27, then it will be false again. So these are two special the under methods that I wanted to show you. And until now, we have learned how we can use those instance method with the self parameter. So what happens if um, we have a method and let's say we forget uh, the self method. 
or this might even be intentional. So let's say we create a function and let's call this entry salary. And this is calculated based on the age. So let's say if age is smaller than 25, we return the salary is 5000. And if the age is smaller than 30, then uh, we return, let's say 7000. And otherwise, if it's even older, then let's say we return 9000. So now we don't use the self parameter. So now let's see what happens if we call this on an instance. So if we say se one dot entry salary and this needs an age. So let's give him the age 24. And now let's run this. And now this will crash. So this produces a type error. Entry salary takes one positional argument, but two were given. So this might be confusing for a beginner. So what the heck does that mean? Two were given. So it seems like two parameters were given, even if there's only one. And if you followed me carefully, then you should already know the answer. Because as I said previously, the self argument is automatically passed for us to this object. So since we use an instance here, it tries to put in self in here. And then it thinks that it has two arguments. But now our function only uses one. So now if we use self here again, then um, this works. So of course, we don't use self here. So if you write it like this, then it works again. So but let's say um, we don't want this in this case. So this is actually intentional. So we want to be able to compute an entry salary if we give it an age. But this doesn't have to be tied to a specific instance. So this is not possible in this case. However, if we call it on the class, then we can say software engineer dot entry salary and let's say 20, let's say 27. And we print this to see the result, then it's working. So it returns 7000. So this is similar to the instance attributes and the class attributes. So here, um, we can only use this function on the class, but not on an instance because we didn't use the self parameter. So yeah, this works, but this will crash. So yeah, that's the difference. And now I want to say that in practice, you will almost never see it like this. So what you will see instead is with a decorator and then we use this decorator static method. So if you don't know what a decorator is, then I have a whole tutorial about this as well. So I will put the link in the description and you can check that out. So now if we have that, then it's still doing the same. So it works on the whole class. So if we run this, then it's still working. And now if we r run it on our instance, so let's print this as well, then this time it's not crashing. So this is working. But um, as I said, this is not tied to a specific instance. So we cannot access those instance attributes. So if we want to compare self dot age, for example, then this will produce an error self is not defined. 
So yeah, in practice, when you see a method in a class that should not be tied to a specific instance, then most of the time you see it with this decorator static method. So then you can apply it on both a instance or the whole class but you cannot access the self attributes in here. So yeah, this was section two. And again, let's do a quick recap what we learned here. So we learned how we can create those instances methods. And we know that we should use the self parameter. Then we learned that our methods can take arguments and they can return values. Then we learned about the or let's write this correctly can take arguments and can return values. Then we learned about the special D under so let's put this in quotation marks D under for double underscore methods so d under method and I showed you the string and the equal method and we learned how we can use the static method so with a decorator and use this on the whole class. All right, so let's continue. And now let's talk about inheritance. So that's probably the most interesting section in this course. So inheritance is the process by which one class takes on the attributes and methods of another class. So this newly formed class is then called a child class and the other one is called the parent class. So let's have a look at what this means and how we do this in practice. So let's say we still have our software engineer class. So for now, let's say only pass. And let's say we also have another um, position. So the designer and for now we also only say pass. And now let's say both are um, positions in a company. So both of them are employees. So let's use a second class and this is a employee. So this class is more general. So let's say our employee should have a name and an age and also the software engineer should have a name and an age. And also the designer should have a name and an age. But then later only our software engineer has this title junior or senior developer and not the designer. So for this we can use this inheritance and we say that our employee is the base class or the parent class. And this is a child class that inherits from this class. And we do this with this syntax. So we use parentheses and then put in the base class. And we do the same for our designer. So our designer also inherits from employee. So now both of these classes are also employees. And what this then means is so first of all, it inherits all of the attributes and functions from the employee. So this will become clearer in a few moments when we do the actual implementation. So we can inherit from this, we can also extend this and we can override this. So also, this will become clearer in a few moments. So first of all, let's um, talk about inheritance. So let's say our employee now should store some attributes. So for this, as you should know, we implement the init function with self and it gets 
the name and the age for now only. So this must be define our function, of course. And then in here, we simply store them. So we say self.name and self.h. So equals h. And now we have this. So we only define the init function in our employee class, but we didn't do anything in the software engineer class. But still our software engineer now has the name and the age. So let's create a instance se equals software engineer. So let's try to use it like this because uh, we don't have any init function in here. So, but now it gives us a type error in it, missing two required positional arguments, name and age. So even though uh, we didn't use an init function in here, it inherits the init function from his parent class from the employee. So we must use this one and this takes a name and an age. So we must use a uh, name max and an age and now if we run us run it then it's working and then we can also access those attributes so we can print se.name and se.age so we see that this is working and now let's do the same for a designer so let's create a designer and this must get a name and an age so let's use um what did we use before for our designer um let's say this is philip and he is 27 and now also for our designer, we can print the name and the age. So designer.name and designer.age. So this is working. And now we are already see how we can inherit the attributes that we defined only in the base class. And the same is true for instance method. So let's define a function in our um, base class and let's call this work. And then here we simply print and then an F string. And then let's first access the name self.name and then let's write is working dot dot dot. So now um, both our software engineer and our designer can work. So we can call se.work and we can call our designer d.work and run this. And then, so let's remove this print statement again. And now if we run it, we see Max is working and Philip is working. So it inherits all the attributes and all the functions here. All right, so now let's have a look at how, so now we already covered the inheritance. So now let's continue and let's talk about extending and overriding the functionality. So of course our software engineer can also have its own methods and attributes. So first let's start with its own init function. So for this, let's say he also has a name and an age, of course, and he should also get the level and the salary. So what we do then is, since we already have this function um, in the base function, we don't do the same code in here, self.name equals name and self.age equals age. Instead, we call the initializer of its parent class and we can do this with the keyword super. So this is referring to its parent class, so to this one, employee, and then we call employee.com in it and this gets the name and the age. 
So now our parent class is initialized correctly. And now we want to store the other parameters that are specific just for our software engineer. So we say self dot level equals level and self dot salary equals salary. And now, by the way, I realized that each employee should have a salary. So I think this is should be better up here. So now also our employee gets a salary and then we have to pass it to our base initializer and um, let's change the order here salary and then the level and we only store the level in our software engineer class. So now um, since we changed that of course we also have to change this initializer so also the designer now needs a salary so let's say 7000 and our software engineer also gets a salary so let's say 6000 and as level let's say junior so now this still works. So if we run the code, we still see Max is working and Philip is working. And now for our software engineer, we can access its level and print this. So now if you print the level, then we see this is junior. But this level attribute now only works for our software engineer and not for a general employee and also not for the designer. So here we see how we extend the functionality and we also already saw how we override functionality. So since we are using this init function here, we are overriding the init function of its parent class. So now we must always use this initializer and then call the super initializer um, in here. So this is also something that we must remember if we use, um, if we override the initializer and the initializer of the parent class is doing something else or something different or other, then we must also call the super initializer here so, so that our object is then initialized correctly. So now everything is working. It has the name, the age, the salary and the level. So this is how we override it. So now let's extend our child classes some more and give them its own functionality. So let's define a function that is only specific to a software engineer. So let's call this function debug and it gets self. And then here inside here we print um, self.name is debugging. So now our software engineer can debug and in our designer class, let's extend this class and let's say our designer can draw and it also gets self and then we print self dot name is drawing. So now our software engineer can debug so now if we run this, then we see Max is debugging and our designer can draw. So now this is working as well. So now we get Philip is drawing and we don't have to double print this here. So this should still print the output. Yes. And now, for example, to make this more clear, our software engineer cannot draw. So if we try to draw with our software engineer, then it gives us this attribute error. Software engineer object has no attribute draw. 
So these functions then are only specific to the child class. So this is how we extend the functionality of the base class. And now let's do one more example how we override the function. So we already saw how to override the init function. And now our base class also has the work um, function. So let's also override this one. So we define the same function in this in the child class. So for the software engineer and also for the designer. And with this, if we use the same function with the same name again, then we override this. And if we use a new function, then we extend this. So in our employee class, we just print um, self.name is working. In our software engineer class, let's say self.name um, is coding. And in our designer class, let's say self.name is designing. And now if we save this and call software engineer dot work and designer dot work, then we see that we get Max is coding and Philip is designing. So we have overridden this function. And now since we created a software engineer, it's taken the overwritten function from this class and not from the parent class. So yeah, so now we see how we can inherit, extend and override functionality. So with this, we can get rid of redundant code and we also um, get code for free. So we don't have to implement, for example, the init function in the child class, but we still can access designer.h and designer.name. And also for all of them, we can access the work function if we don't implement them in here. So if we do it like this and call this uh, software engineer.work, then it's still working. So yeah, and I hope that it's starting to become clear that this is a very powerful concept that you should know about. So yeah, now we learned about inheritance and now let's talk about one other principle of the object oriented programming. And this is called polymorphism. And what this means, so this is Greek and means many shapes. And this is closely related to inheritance. So we can write code that works on the super class, but it will also work with any subclass type as well. So simply put, polymorphism gives us a way to use a class exactly like its parent but still each child class keeps its own methods as they are. So let me show you an example. So let's say we have a collection of employees and for now we don't care which type of employee this is. So we have a employees list and this is a list. And then in here, we, for example, we create a software engineer, then let's create another software engineer. So this is Lisa. She is, let's say 30 and her salary 9000 and she is a senior. And then we also have this designer in here. So now we have this collection of employees and we want to treat them just as an employee. So we don't care what's the actual um, child class right now. So let's say we are somewhere else in our code. So let me scroll down so that we don't see it anymore. 
So let's say we are in the, for example, we are in the HR department and we want to motivate our employees. So we write a function, define motivate employees. And this gets a list of employees. But here we don't know what type of employees they are. We simply want to iterate here and say for employee in employees. And then we can call employee dot work. So this will work on all employees. But then we get the specific um, implementation of the child class. So it can take different shapes. So this is what polymorphism means. So now let's call this function motivate employees and we pass in this list that we created. Then it iterates over each one and prints um, that the work function. So um, let me comment this out and this out. So these are the only um, work calls that we should see. And now let's run this. And then we see this is working. And we get Max is coding, Lisa is coding and Philip is designing. So yeah, this is the concept of polymorphism. And now let's do a quick recap again of our third section. So what we learned here is we learned about inheritance and um, that we can use it with a child class and this inherits from a base class with this syntax. Then we learned that we can inherit the attributes and functions here. We can also extend attributes and functions and we can override functionality. And uh, we learned about the super um, init function. So if we override the init in a child class, then we must be careful and should remember to call the super class of the base class, uh, the super method of the base class. And we learned about the concept of polymorphism. All right, so now let's continue with section four. And now let's talk about two more concepts of object oriented programming. And this is encapsulation and abstraction. So let's first talk about encapsulation. So encapsulation is the mechanism of hiding of data implementation. So this means that instance variables are kept private and there's only one accessor method from the outside with which we can access or change these instance variables. So with this, we restrict the access to public methods, so-called getter and setter methods. And we can also do the same for methods. So instance methods can be kept private so that they should only be used internally and not from the outside. So let's write some code so that this will become clearer. So let's define a class again for our software engineer. And here we again define the init function with double underscores and self. And now um, again, let's say it gets the name and the age. And then we say self.name equals name and self.age equals age. So right now we don't want to set the salary. So let's say the salary should be private. So no one should see this except later maybe the HR department can access the salary and also set the salary. So for now, let's create an internal 
variable, an internal attribute, and this should be private. So by convention, we use one uh, underscore here and then the name. So self underscore salary. And in the beginning, this should be none. And then let's also use another private attribute and let's call this the number of bucks solved. So this will be useful later for an internal function. And in the beginning, this is zero. So right now, these can be accessed from the outside, but these should be kept private. So if we now let's create a object again, a instance se equals software engineer and the name is max and the age is let's say 25. So we can print se dot age and we can print se dot name. So let's run this. And now um, we shouldn't access the salary from the outside. So technically in Python, this is not completely private. So for example, we can access the self dot salary. So if we initialize this with 5000 and save this and run this comma, then technically this is working. So we can access this from the outside, but we shouldn't. So for each attribute or function with an underscore, this should be kept internal. So if we want to make it really private, then we could use a double leading underscore. And now if we try to access this, then this will not work. So this will raise an attribute error because from the outside, it doesn't see this variable here because we use this private syntax. But yeah, in practice, you almost never see this, but you see one leading underscore in practice a lot. So yeah, so as I said, technically you can access this, but you shouldn't access this from the outside. And yeah, so right now we have public variables or attributes and private attributes. And now these are only used internal. But now let's say our HR department needs a way to access those variables. So we can say we define a public function get salary and here we simply return this. So we return self dot underscore salary. So again, here we are inside of this class. So this means we should be able to access this. And then also from the outside, our HR department should be able to set the salary. So we define a function set salary and this gets self and then it gets a value. And now here we set this. So we say self dot um, self dot salary equals value. And now let's change this to none in the beginning. And then from the outside, what we do here is we say se dot set salary, let's say 6000 and then se dot get salary and print this then this should print 6000. And here I made a beginner mistake. So I said we should always remember to put in self. And now I forgot it myself. So yeah, put in self and run this again. So yeah, so now it's working. So we see we get 6000 here. So now we should be able to access and modify it from the outside. But these two functions, so called getters and 
setters. This should be the only way from the outside to access this internal self dot underscore salary attribute. So why is this useful? Why should we apply such a concept with this encapsulation and this private attribute? So for example, what we could do here is when we set the salary, we could do some more stuff. For example, we can check the value if this is actually a valid salary. We can also enforce some constraints. So we can be funny here and say if the value first, let's check it. If it's smaller than 1000, then let's say no, this shouldn't be possible. Then let's still say self dot um, salary equals 1000. And if we accidentally put in more here, if our value is greater than 20,000, then let's also restrict it. Let's say this shouldn't be possible. Then this should be um, 20,000 and not more. So we can do checks. We can enforce constraints or we can of course do other stuff. For example, we can check if the bank, uh, the bank information is still valid. So yeah, that's why the scatter and setter can be useful. And now let's also show you how we can apply this concept for a private function. So let's give it first, let's give our um, software engineer the code function first again with self and then in here what we want to do we want to increase the number of bucks solved so we say self dot num bucks solved plus equals one so now it should be clear that um, there is no need to access this variable from the outside the only place where this is relevant is when we do work with our software engineer. So when he is coding, then he is also solving bugs. So this is the only place where this will be increased. And so yeah, so this is one um, more internal thing. And now let's say when we set the salary, we only want to set a base salary from the HR department because the HR department is not so familiar with the work the software engineer is doing. So they are only setting a base value of the salary. And then inside here, we calculate this. So based on how productive our software engineer was, so for this, let's write a internal function. And now this also gets a leading underscore. And let's call this define underscore calculate salary. And this gets self and this should get the base value here. And then we check if self dot underscore num bucks solved is smaller than 10 then we simply return the base value if self dot num bucks solved is smaller than 100 then we apply a factor so we return base value times 2 so he gets double the salary and otherwise, if he even solved more than a hundred bucks, then we say we return base value times three. And now in here, um, so let's get rid of those constraints. So we don't want them right now. So let's say our self dot salary equals self dot underscore calculate base uh, calculate salary with the base value. So now this is how we do this. And now again, we only want to do this internally. 
there is no way or uh, there's no need from the outside to call this the only thing we want to call from the outside is then set salary and get salary so now let's say we have a software engineer and let's say he is being very productive so let's say for i in range and then let's say one uh, let's only use 70 right now and then we call se dot code so he is coding 70 times this means that our number of bucks solved um, should be 70 so for now we can do a quick check so we can say print se dot and as i said we can access those um, private parameters this is just for demonstration that this works so yeah but we shouldn't do this but we see this is 70 and now we set a base salary and now if we print the base salary so then it should be in this if case and it should apply the factor 2 so now if we get this then we should get 12,000 actually so let's run this and see if this is working and we see we have 12,000 here so our code is working fine and yeah so this was all in section 4 so now we talked about encapsulation so the mechanism of hiding data implementation and restricting the access so we see how we can use public getter and setter functions and then they access a private attribute inside and we also can use private functions and they are all um, defined with a leading underscore so this is the concept of encapsulation and now only one principle in, is missing and this is the principle of abstraction and this can be thought of as a natural extension of encapsulation so applying abstraction means that that each object should only expose a high level mechanism for using it so this mechanism should hide internal implementation deta details it should only reveal the operations relevant for the other objects so again if we have a look at this set salary function then this is applying the abstraction principle so we only from the outside the hr department for example should only be able to set the salary like this but they don't care about this internal implementation calculate salary with this um, factor applyment so yeah so this is abstraction And now we already covered all the four principles. So I will show them again at the end. And now let's talk about one more thing. And this is about properties and um, the setters and getters. So instead of using these function get salary and set salary, there is a more Pythonic way to do this. And now let me show you how we do this. So first of all, let me clean this code. So let's get rid of all the other things so that the demonstration will get clearer. So let's remove this and this and this. And this is only the value. So we have this and then we remove this one and now we create a software engineer and as I, as before we are able to set the salary and get the salary so let's run this and we see this is working so yeah so as I said there is a more Pythonic way 
And this is with a so-called property. So for the getter, um, we give it the name of the property that we want. So we use the salary name without the underscore. And then we use a decorator and use the property decorator. So again, if you don't know how decorators work, then check out my tutorial. And now instead of this set salary, um, what we do here is we again give it the same name here. And then we also use a decorator and then again the same name salary and then dot setter. So now we have a getter and a setter. And now what we can do here is we can instead of calling this function, we can simply say se dot salary equals 6000. And we get the salary by accessing the property without these parentheses. So now if we run this, then it's still working. And this is a more Pythonic way of doing it than using the get and the set function. And there is also one more uh, decorator and this is the salary at at salary deleter and what we do here is we delete self dot salary and this doesn't get a value so now we can um, call delete uh, se dot salary and now when we try to print this again then we should get an error so now we see software engineer object has no attribute salary because we deleted it. And if we remove this and run this, then it's working. So yeah, in practice, I don't think that you see this one very often, but you should be aware that this is also available. And again, why do we do this this way instead of just using self.salary here? and then um, uh, setting and accessing it like this. So again, this should apply this encapsulation principle that this should be the only way from the outside to access this. And for example, here again, we can do some checks or constraints or internal calculations. So again, let's do a recap. So we talked about the encapsulation principle and we talked about the abstraction principle. Then we talked about public and private methods and attributes. And for example, we learned that we use a underscore here for a function and also for a attribute, a leading underscore. And we learned how to use getter and setter methods, which are the only way to access them from the outside. And we also learned a more Pythonic way for the getter. We can use a property and for the setter, we use this at decorator and then the name, let's say only X dot setter like we are doing here. So yeah, this is everything I wanted to cover here. So now let's go back to our four principles of object oriented programming. So I hope that they are clearer now for you. So again, let's go over the definitions one more time. So what is inheritance? Inheritance is the process by which one class takes on the attributes and methods of another and newly formed classes are called child classes and the classes the child classes are derived from are the parent classes. Child classes inherit all of the parents attributes and methods but can also extend and override the attributes and methods that are then unique to themselves. Then we have 
polymorphism, which, which means many shapes. So this means we can write a code that works well on the superclass and it will also work with any subclass type as well. So this gives us a way to use a class exactly like its parent, but each child class keeps its own methods as they are. Then we have encapsulation. Encapsulation is the mechanism of hiding of data implementation. So instance variables are kept private and accessor methods are made public to achieve this. So with this, we restrict the access to those public getter and setter methods. And the same for instance methods, they can also be kept private. And then we have abstraction. So this can be thought of as a natural extension of encapsulation. And applying abstraction means that each object should only expose a high level mechanism for it. This mechanism should hide internal implementation details. It should only reveal operations relevant for the other objects. So yeah, we covered a lot today and these are all the essential topics that you should know about object oriented programming. There are still a couple of more concepts, more advanced concepts in Python available, but I think for now this should be enough and I hope that you enjoyed this tutorial and then I hope to see you in the next video. Bye.